Christian Bryant. We've got an hour's worth of news, stories, and other fixings headed your way. And if you need to get up and move around and get things sorted for Thanksgiving dinner, be my guest. Just save me a plate. Here's what we got for y'all in this episode. A jury delivered guilty verdicts in the trial of the killing of Ahmaud Arbery. We have those updates and a look at what other charges those men face. Then Vermont sorta nailed the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, but even with one of the highest rates of vaccination, the state is now seeing an uptick in cases. We talked to the Secretary of Human Services there about lessons learned from their fight against COVID. But first, when it comes to shopping, Everybody loves a good deal. Black Friday is a few days away, and you may be one of the many people doing a little online shopping and on the lookout for a designer fit. But if the price of something online seems too good to be true, how do you know if the item is the real deal and not some kind of knockoff? It's becoming a more relevant question as online counterfeit goods become more prominent. Between October of 2020 and July of this year, US Customs and Border Protection made over 22,000 seizures of counterfeit goods worth $2.5 billion. And they say it only gets worse during the holiday season. Half of consumers say they may have purchased a fake item while checking off their holiday shopping list. The majority of counterfeit goods come to the US from China, making up over 90% of these types of shipments. Officials warn that fake goods can be dangerous to your health and safety. Items ranging from medication and personal care items to car and gun parts have been seized at ports of entry. During the pandemic, we also saw fake PPE, COVID test kits, and vaccination cards being shipped into the country. We were seeing hundreds and thousands of packages coming from unknown labs, basically, to the consumer in the United States. Counterfeit items also have a major impact on the economy, costing over $500 billion a year worldwide. And the lost sales of real items lead to a loss of wholesale and retail jobs as fake goods cause a shift in the normal trade channels. This year, the Chamber of Commerce and Customs and Border Protection signed a first-of-its-kind memorandum aimed at strengthening the efforts to stop the importation of fake goods. Together, the organizations plan to conduct training and outreach events to improve public awareness. People can also report counterfeits through an online reporting system. In recent years, the internet has made it easier for people to scam others with fake goods. E-commerce shopping has grown from 3 to 10% of all retail purchases. Despite the current supply chain issues, even online holiday shopping is forecasted to jump 10% from last year. People just love the convenience of shopping right from the comfort of their home. With online marketplaces like AliExpress, which was launched by Alibaba in 2010, and Amazon, which launched its marketplace for third-party retailers in 2014, scammers can hide behind these companies to sell their products. Last year, almost $300 billion worth of products were sold on Amazon through third parties. Newsy's Tyler Adkison looks at the role they've played in selling these types of goods and how they're regulating them. If you buy something on a large e-commerce site like Amazon, around half the time it's not actually coming from the tech giant itself, but from a third-party seller. E-commerce companies rely on third-party sellers to supply products to consumers quickly, especially those that may not be available at their warehouses. Experts say this third-party system, coupled with increased consumer demand around e-commerce, is driving a huge chunk of counterfeit goods sales in the U.S. Back 20 years ago, if you were buying a counterfeit product, it was typically apparel and you were going to a flea market uh, and you're, you were buying that good. With the advent of the internet, it opened up consumers to a whole different range of goods that they could buy. But criminals also saw that, right? They saw the opportunity with more and more people getting online. When you buy something on Amazon, it falls into one of three purchase buckets. Goods that are sold and shipped by Amazon, items that are sold by third-party businesses to Amazon, who then ships the goods out, and items that are both sold and shipped by third-party sellers, but are listed on Amazon's marketplace. In 2020, third-party businesses accounted for nearly 60% of all sales on Amazon's marketplace. Amazon also added more than 200,000 new third-party sellers in 2020, a 45% increase from the year before. Counterfeit goods experts told Newsy that the barriers to entry for third-party sellers selling counterfeits is so low that there's no real disincentive to stay off these platforms. You don't have to make an agreement with a store or buy a stall at a flea market. All you have to do is do some basic setup work and become a third-party seller on 
a website like Amazon or Walmart.com or any of these major, major websites that are offering third-party sellers the opportunity to sell directly to the consumers. Giannopoulos told Newsy that getting rid of these bad actors is a lot like playing whack-a-mole. According to Amazon's website, it bans the sale of counterfeit goods on their platform, including bootlegs or pirated copies of content. But that content can often be hard to find and widespread across its marketplace. Still, Amazon proactively removed 10 billion counterfeit listings in 2020, up from 6 billion the year before. It also destroyed 2 million items in its warehouses that were identified as counterfeits. And if they get caught or if they get taken down, they can pop up again under a different name or using a different method or going onto a different website, such as going from Amazon to Newegg or from Walmart to Sears Marketplace or whatever it might be in order to continue to sell their goods. Congress is looking to push these e-commerce companies to better track potential counterfeit sellers. A bipartisan group of senators wants to pass the Informed Consumers Act, which would require online marketplaces to provide more transparent data on the identity of third-party sellers. When you go on so many of these websites, these marketplaces, um, you don't know who you're buying from, uh, and there's really no regulations around that. So what the bill would do is to say, hey, marketplaces, Amazon, Facebook, if you have a high volume seller, make sure that you know who they are. Let's verify those sellers and make sure that consumers have the ability to see who they're buying from. Tyler Adkison, Newsy, Chicago. All right, we're not done with Newsy's Tyler Adkison just yet. He's been diving into the topic of counterfeit goods and how they get out into the world. So Tyler, can you help us understand how to spot the difference between a legitimate product and a counterfeit one, specifically when shopping online on sites like Amazon? Really, I think the main thing that consumers need to keep in mind is that just because you see something listed on Amazon doesn't mean that it means that Amazon is actually selling it. You know, for instance, if you see on a thing that you're purchasing that the delivery or the purchase is being fulfilled by Amazon, it really just means that Amazon is serving as the platform for a third party seller to get those goods out. And you know, consumers should really use extra scrutiny here when it comes to what they're buying from these third party groups because oftentimes the product that's listed on marketplace by these third parties may look legit when it's really not. You know, in some cases you might be able to look at the photos of the package design of what you're buying online and work out some distinguishable elements that may look like a red flag there. For instance, if you see misspellings on the labeling, that's probably a sign that the product is counterfeit, especially if it's, you know, misspelling words like manufacturer, the city that the uh, product is being claimed to be made in. Um, you know, also check the pricing of the good itself, because in a lot of cases, these cyber criminals will sell goods at a discounted rate to make the deals look really good. You know, experts told me the best thing to do is a classic gut check. If the price is too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. Um, so you really also check the price of what you're buying against the actual seller, and if you see something like a 50% difference, then stay away. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is that when you buy from a third party, sometimes they will have the contact information for those businesses uh, in case there are problems with your purchase later on. You know, if they have a website, if they have an email address that you can actually send a message to when you have a problem, that's usually a good sign that you can trust the third party service there. But Again, one of the things to keep in mind here is that these cyber criminals are smart and just because they list something that shows that there is an email for you to go to in order to be able to uh, lodge a complaint, it may be part of a social engineering scam used by these uh, counterfeit groups in order to make it seem like what you're buying from is original. So really one of the things that's kind of difficult right now is that a lot of the onus on making sure what you're purchasing is really on the consumer to make sure that it's good. Um, so when it comes down to it, things like the Inform Act will help, but right now, it really does rely on us to be more vigilant about what we're purchasing online. All right, many thanks, Tyler. When you're back, we'll update you on the murder trial in the killing of Ahmaud Arbery. See you in just a bit. Welcome back, gang. After two days of deliberations, the jury in the trial over the killing of Ahmaud Arbery has handed down its verdict. I never thought this day would come, but God is good. Yes, he is. He is. And I just want to tell everybody, thank you, thank you 
for those who marched, those who, who prayed, most of all, the, the ones who prayed. Yes, Lord. Yes. Thank you, God. Yes, Lord. Thank you. And now, now, Quez, which I, which you know him as Ahmad, I know him as Quez. Yes. He will now rest in peace. Yes, Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Travis McMichael, who was shown to be the one that actually fired the shots that killed Arbery, has been found guilty on all nine charges he faced, including malice murder and felony murder. His father was found guilty of eight charges, including felony murder. William Bryan, who filmed the video, was found guilty of six of the nine charges, including felony murder. Since all three men were convicted of felony murder charges, they could face life in prison. The defense's argument hinged on a citizen's arrest law, a Civil War era law that Georgia lawmakers have largely repealed in the time since Arbery was killed. Arbery was shot and killed on February 23rd in 2020 while jogging in broad daylight. It took more than two months for the suspects to be arrested, and that happened only after a video of the incident was leaked by an attorney. All three men face sentences of up to life in prison for these charges on the state level. They'll be back in court in February to face hate crime charges on the federal level. Now, we know that's a story that'll keep dominating the news cycle, but that isn't the only story circulating today. Here's what else is making waves on social media. A federal jury said this week that some of the nation's biggest pharmacies, CVS, Walgreens, and Walmart, played a role in the opioid crisis by unnecessarily distributing pain pills in two Ohio counties. The two Ohio counties said that the pharmacies caused hundreds of deaths and cost each of the counties about a billion dollars because of their reckless distribution. In their defense, the pharmacies put the onus on the doctors who prescribed those pills in the first place. All three said they would appeal. This first-of-its-kind verdict could open the door for plaintiffs in other lawsuits who want to hold pharmacies accountable for this epidemic. It comes at a time when a record number of people have died from opioid overdoses. According to the National Center for Health Statistics, in the 12-month period ending in April of 2021, more than 100,000 people died, which is up almost 30% from the period prior. A federal judge will determine how much the companies owe each county in the spring. All right, switching gears here. I try to stray away from talking about people's feet during ITL, but we're gonna make an exception in the interest of public service. During an appearance on the Pat McAfee Show Tuesday, Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers gave an update on his COVID recovery. Yeah, I felt good in just a few days um, and didn't have any lingering effects um, other than the COVID toe. All right, so after that, Aaron Rodgers dropped back and said he doesn't have COVID toe, he has a fractured toe. But this gives us an opportunity to clear up what that is. While COVID toe may sound like some old Southern ailment, it's actually the nickname for a condition felt by folks who may have been exposed to COVID-19. The term was coined early in the pandemic when dermatologists were inundated with cases of people dealing with lesions and inflammation in their toes. Now, according to a recent study from the British Journal of Dermatology, we know that the condition is a side effect of the immune system kicking into high gear, possibly after exposure. What's worse, COVID toe can be exacerbated by cold temperatures. If you're suffering from this, there is good news. Dermatologists say that the lesions can be treated with anti-inflammatory medication, and in some cases, they can resolve on their own. Here's a question. What do the Defense Department and dogs with sticks have in common? They just won't let it go. Determined to make sure UFOs stay top of mind, the DOD announced the creation of the Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group, or AOIMSG. UFO hunters must have been taken. The new task force is the follow-up to the U.S. Navy's Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force. It's meant to coordinate efforts across the department and the U.S. government in detecting and identifying any airborne object, including the unidentified ones, in special use airspace. This announcement comes after a report this summer from a Pentagon task force pointed out there had been 144 reports of unidentified objects over a 17 year period, and they were only able to identify one of those objects. As a skeptic, you gotta admit, now would be an odd time for aliens to show up on Earth. Kind of like an unexpected guest when your house is a wreck, right? When lockdowns first became the new norm, animal shelters were bumping. People started adopting pets left and right in record numbers. And I mean, 
it seemed like a good time, right? According to the National Pet Owner Survey, nearly 70% of US households currently own a pet. But the thing is, animals are still crowding shelters across the country. National correspondent Dan Grossman shows us why that's happening and what you can do to help. All right. Hey guys, so we've got Hank right here. If you've ever stepped foot into a place like this, Are we got Miss Mabel. Loves to say hi. You can understand the indescribable and sometimes immediate connection that exists between man and dog. Hi, Papa. I'm gonna open this one just a little bit just to say hi. Sadly. Hi, Papa. This is crypto. Sometimes. Love is not enough. It's tough being close to the public because you don't have a lot of people come through. So when you do meet new people that they want to take home with them, they tend to attend, attach to us. So it can be pretty difficult sometimes. For the last few months, Luis Vasquez has been in the difficult position of trying to create a home for animals who could not be further from home. During much of the pandemic, these stalls at this Arkansas shelter remained bare. But as you can see and hear, that is no longer the case as more people have dropped off animals they cared for only a few months ago. I know a lot of the calls I've been fielding lately have been people who um, have lost their home or apartment. They've been evicted. They don't know what to do and they can't you know, live on the streets with the animal. They want to do the right thing. Ryan Gutierrez is the shelter's program administrator and knows this is as confounding as many of the other issues COVID has presented. Intake levels at many shelters nationwide are about where they were pre-pandemic, but the monetary donations aren't there to support the same number of staff. Add on more people who are giving away pets because they can't support them and you have this. Shelters desperately looking to find forever homes. We were seeing maybe for a long time only 10 dogs on the adoption floor, and now it's 22. And that's a full house for us, and it's consistently been 22. As soon as we adopt a dog out, we're moving dogs back up. This shelter and many others have turned to social media, posting about owners who are looking to offload their pets. The system allows the animals to go directly to another home and bypass the shelter environment, making them more comfortable during this difficult transition. It's better that way because the owner's gonna know this animal best. The, the shelter environment's scary for animals. For now, the tactics have allowed shelters like these to scrape by and keep these animals safe. At-home services that offer euthanasia report being busier than ever, but staff like Ryan and Louise Hope anyone who has the capacity and ability to care for a pet to come forward so these animals can find the homes they deserve. It's been pretty intense, but we're doing the best that we can with all the dogs that we have. I'm Dan Grossman. Many thanks, Dan. After the break, we are turning to the world of drones and seeing how this technology can benefit a number of businesses. Imagine there's no more Amazon Prime, FedEx, or UPS trucks bringing packages to your house. Everything is delivered, wait for it, by drones. That might sound too good to be true, or it might sound like a nightmare scenario depending on how you feel about tech, but some companies are working on turning this into a reality. This technology can not only be used for deliveries, but it can also help do other jobs in place of people. National correspondent Chloe Nordquist explains how the drone industry is expanding and how it can benefit businesses. We take the box, we coordinate with the customer directly to make sure that the delivery window is when they want it to occur. And, uh, and then we fly it over and, and we drop it usually into their backyard or to their, their front yard. That's exactly what Zipline, a development and delivery company for drone aerial logistics, is doing in partnership with Walmart. We ultimately decided that it would be best to start working in Northwest Arkansas together. So over the course of the past spring, we built our facility. Now we are in a place where we're actually starting to deliver real things to real people. This is just one example of how the drone industry is expanding into other parts of our lives and continues to grow exponentially. We saw the use of drones kind of skyrocketing. Kyle Hirschkind is the program manager at the University of New Hampshire Drone Academy. And we've seen just pretty much every year the industry kind of explode a little bit more. Um, and that brings more to our end in what we can do and what we can train people to do. They've seen interest from real estate to agriculture and law enforcement. And these companies are focused on more than just outdoors. Started the company to basically solve the problem of how do you get into you know, 
confined spaces or dirty, dangerous environments um, without having to send people in there. Clio Robotics recently made the Drone Nut, the first commercially available indoor drone with ducted by rotors that's highly maneuverable. What we settled on is this uh, technology that's been around for about 70 years, just called ducted uh, fan drones. It's still a drone, but uh, it's a much safer, much more compact, uh, more capable drone. CEO Omar El Orion says it's easy to use and can be used for a number of purposes from inspection to active shooter situations. It could be used on factory floors, could be used on in warehousing for keeping track of inventory. But with this increase in drone use also comes more safety concerns. Part 107 small U.S. rules only came out in 2016, which was, you know, only only five years ago. And before that, there were no FAA rules about how to fly drones. I mean, they were everywhere, but it was kind of a kind of the Wild West. James Alexander is chief of safety at the University of Maryland's unmanned aircraft test site. He's referring to the rules put in place by the Federal Aviation Administration. Drones aren't going away. They're here. <laughs> so they just have to um, do do what kind of the best combination for what's good for the industry and balancing that with, uh, with safety and everything. The industry is only expected to grow from here, meaning more drones flying through the skies above us. There's projections out there that say it's going to go, you know, it's going to double by the time we reach 2025 in terms of drone deliveries, drone, you know, data collection and things of that sort. I'm Chloe Nordquist reporting. Much appreciated, Chloe. Across the country, the remains of thousands of Native Americans were dug up and used for research or given to museums. But no one asked for permission. This has been going on for hundreds of years, and now tribes are working to take back what is theirs and bring their ancestors home. But it's not an easy process. They have to prove that the remains belong to them. National correspondent Alexa Liako tells us more. Traditions here run deeper than the roots in these waters. Our home is a cypress swamp. It's a sawgrass prairie, but we find it home. And in this home, it's tradition to honor those who came before. The health of our ancestors is the health of our living people. For Tina Osceola, when I was growing up, my my grandmother wore beads like that. Preserving the ways of her seminal ancestors has become her life's work. Cooking over an open fire is something that we still do today. Now she's working to save something even more precious. We want our ancestors back. Plain and simple. Over the years, the remains of more than 1,000 seminal ancestors were excavated out of their graves and taken from this land for research. No one talked to the tribes. Some of these digs that happened more than 100 years ago were people just out digging around looking for them you know, and then turning them over to universities and museums. Today, more than 1,400 ancestral remains sit inside the Smithsonian Museum. It's so important that they come home. You know, they, they belong here. Under federal law, tribes can bring home or repatriate their ancestors and what they were buried with. But the tribe must prove to the museum the remains belong to them. We know where they came from. We know who these ancestors are. Dominique de Bobian has worked for the tribe since 2011. So we never want to disturb an ancestor once they're at rest. She's led the effort to bring the ancestors home but it's a complicated job. Up until last year, the tribe could only claim remains that could be culturally identified or easily connected to the tribe. The Seminoles claimed 27 individuals. Each individual from each location. In 2020, the Smithsonian changed its rules to say tribes can repatriate culturally unaffiliated remains, meaning there's little known about the remains and it's harder to prove they belong to one tribe. That opened the door to bringing home more than 1,400 culturally unidentifiable ancestors and the Seminoles want every one of these ancestors back. All the ancestors from the state of Florida the tribe considers to be their people. We have collections from throughout the world. Hundreds of miles away the Smithsonian says it will send those remains home. We will work with them for a successful repatriation. 
Dr. Bill Billick runs the repatriation department at the Smithsonian and says this is only the beginning of a wider effort. There's been a lot of progress that's been made on repairing the damage. There's still a long way to go. He says he will make sure every remain the Seminole tribe is owed comes home. I take that very seriously that we do that right. They know the process will take years, but Tina looks to the past to keep pushing forward. They never quit. They died for us so that we could live. And what would it be like if I quit now? I'm Alexa Liaco reporting. When we're back, we're talking about one state that's been applauded for its handling of the pandemic and how they're dealing with a new challenge. We'll see you in just a bit. Welcome back to In The Loop, folks. We've spent so much time during this pandemic talking about states that were hit hard by the virus. New York and New Jersey in the spring of 2020, Florida and Texas in the summer of 2020, southern states hit by the Delta variant this past summer. But we want to take a bit of time to highlight a pandemic success story. Northern New England has been one of the best regions in the country at managing to keep COVID case rates and death rates low. Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire are all in the top 10 lowest overall per capita COVID case and death rates. Vermont in particular has been a resounding success with the lowest death rate and second lowest case rate in the nation since the start of the pandemic. And its vaccine rollout has been efficient and successful with some of the highest vaccination rates in the nation. The state's public health department says 82% of Vermonters have received at least one dose of a vaccine, including already more than a third of kids ages 5 to 11. The state's rollout has benefited from cooperation from political leadership across the state. While progressives like Bernie Sanders represent the state in Washington, D.C., and its state legislature is heavily Democratic, its governor, Phil Scott, is a Republican. All of them have pushed for limiting COVID spread and encouraging vaccination. Vermont also has a strong culture of community and public health advocacy, as we found earlier this year when we reported on the vaccine rollout in the Green Mountain State. Our government has shown itself to be trustworthy, and it's bipartisan in a way that's just not comprehensible in this country. But there might be a bit of a downside to having such an efficient and early vaccination rollout. Case counts are now rising in Vermont faster than nearly anywhere else in the U.S. The vast majority of cases are in unvaccinated residents, but the number of breakthrough infections is rising. It could be a consequence of a quick vaccine rollout early on. Vermont was able to vaccinate more than 90% of its adults over 70 by late April. The governor announced last Wednesday that he would ask all residents 18 and older to get booster shots, moving before the FDA or CDC announced changes in booster eligibility. Joining us now is Michael Smith, the secretary of the Vermont Agency of Human Services. His agency oversees the state's Department of Health and has coordinated public health messaging during the pandemic and vaccine rollouts in the state. Michael. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me today. We know Vermont has one of the highest, if not the highest vaccination rate in the U.S. How have you all been able to do that? And how do you hope to repeat that with vaccinating kids and giving out booster shots? You have to sort of, um, first of all, thank Vermonters for doing what is right to do, getting vaccines here. But one of the things I think is that early on, we decided as state government that we were gonna to work together. We delivered the vaccines to the homebound. So we had a very wide way, including pop-ups at um, fairs, at the various places where Vermonters go, whether it's you know at farmer's markets or other things. We had pop-ups there to vaccinate people during that time. So talking about boosters, we've, we've had really good success with um, children five to 11. In fact, we're number one in the nation right now in terms of uh, the success that we've had in booster, providing, boost, uh, providing vaccine to children five to 11. And we're also number one in providing uh, boosters to the population that are eligible for uh, for boosters. So 
in many other states, we've seen very strong political divides between uh, Republicans and Democrats, um, especially on issues related to uh, COVID-19 and how best to address this pandemic. Uh, how have officials in your state tried to get around that? Yeah, we've worked uh, very well um, with uh, across both parties. The governor here in Vermont is a Republican. The congressional delegation is our Democrats, uh, Senator Sanders, Senator Leahy, and Representative Welch. We have worked very closely with them and uh, throughout this pandemic. We don't see the divide here in Vermont um, that we've seen elsewhere in the country. Now, that's not to say it won't happen, but it hasn't happened so far. And I think that's been to our benefit that it hasn't happened. Cases and hospitalizations have risen significantly in the state in the last few weeks, despite the high vaccination rates. Um, what is your understanding of why that is? So I have a lot of information about those new cases. 70 to 75 percent on, on average are people that are unvaccinated. Now, some of them can't be vaccinated under five. And, you know, it's not fair yet because there hasn't been enough time for five to 11. But there's a big swath uh, between 12 and, you know, 65 that we are seeing that are unvaccinated. And that is something that I think, you know, you look at the case counts and you look at where this Delta variant is hitting, it's all the unvaccinated. You know, 70 to 75% of our case counts each night are unvaccinated, as well as our hospitalizations, by the way. This Delta variant will find the people that are unvaccinated and it has. Ironically, what we've seen with the boosters also, um, which is something that's really good, is that we've seen um, the positive, the number of cases in 65 and above where we've had really high uptake in the boosters really level off. Michael Smith, thank you so much for joining us. Michael is the secretary of the Vermont Agency of Human Services. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. We'll be right back after a short break, but stick with us since in a moment we'll have more on vaccine and COVID issues, including answering the question, should we still be wearing masks? See you in a bit. Welcome back, gang. While we have seen signs of getting more of the American population vaccinated, there's still one group of people that remain hesitant. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, only about a third of pregnant people are vaccinated. There have been some serious rumors and misinformation circulating around fertility and the COVID-19 vaccine. And while those rumors and bits of misinformation have been debunked, some people are still concerned. National correspondent Chris Stewart talked to one pregnant woman who says more needs to be done to get the right information to expectant mothers like her. That's my mom. This is her spirit captured in a photo. She's such a bundle of energy and joy. She just loved her. These are the moments, grandmother and granddaughter, that can now only exist in Fiona Garza Tulip's memories. How many years ago was that? That was, okay, February 26, 2020. So it was not too long before she died. COVID-19 took her mom in July of last year. She caught it at work and died a week after feeling her symptoms. I didn't even know she was sick until two days before she died. She says the virus also took her uncle and left her dad with long haul symptoms that require around the clock care. <laughs> but after so much loss in less than a month, She'll give her two-year-old daughter a brother. I'm excited to smile <laughs> when he comes. Like, I'm excited to feel real joy that he's here and he's breathing and that we fought through some of the darkest times of my life together. 
She was only four weeks into her pregnancy when she got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in April. It was in honor of my mom and I just I knew there was no question if I was going to get it. But a couple of weeks ago, when it came time to get her booster shot, she says even as a major supporter of vaccines, she became nervous when her pharmacy only had Pfizer or Moderna. That was the first time I was kind of nervous. And it was because I've heard so many stories about people questioning whether, you know, it, is it, can you mix? Is it okay? And, um, you know, you're, you're, just about to have the baby in like four weeks. Is that safe? The FDA says it is okay to mix vaccines, which Fiona did. I'm thinking, no, go back to the science. Listen to the science. Look, the FDA says it's okay and trust that. <laughs> These are the kinds of questions OBGYN Dr. Beth Carew hears from her patients. Pregnancy is one of those really hard times in life when we become very conscious of the things that we do, the things we put into our bodies. No research has found that vaccination leads to an increased risk of issues like miscarriage. As for the damage the virus can do, evidence shows problems like a higher risk of preterm birth. The more and more data we have really shows that the risks of COVID are really high and the risks of the vaccine are really low. You wanna go inside here? Yeah. I think pregnant women need to see other pregnant women who have gotten it and had the baby. And it's happening, but not enough people are sharing the story about it. Fiona says while the virus has taken so much from her, when she soon welcomes a new life, it will be proof of what COVID could not. I'm Chris Stewart reporting. So we know now that breakthrough infections can happen, even if you're boosted and vaxxed up. But the holiday season is here, and even the nation's top infectious disease doctor, Dr. Fauci, said family gatherings are okay. That got us wondering. Where does that leave us with mask wearing indoors? As cities and states around the country weigh their mask mandates, the Washington Post video team talked to experts to get the latest advice on when it's okay to go for the full face reveal. Washington DC's local mask mandate has finally been lifted. It was one of the strictest mandates in the nation, starting in the summer when the Delta variant made COVID cases spike again. We're shifting the government's response to providing you this risk-based uh, information. As cities and states around the country weigh their own mandates, we're gonna have a choice to make, to wear or not to wear a mask. And if I'm being honest, that's a lot of freedom I'm not sure I'm ready for. So I asked some experts for advice. It would be, I think, premature to lift those mandates at this point, right before we hit the winter surge, I think it's, it's a mistake. Winters are already hard on hospital systems. And while vaccines have proven to keep most people out of hospitals, some experts aren't sure how effective they are at keeping you from giving the virus to someone else. People who have been immunized, the immunity wanes over time. There's a little bit of a lag time from the time you get the virus hits your nose to the time your immune system recognizes and reacts to it. You have an immune system in place, and so it's going to prevent the virus from giving you bad pneumonia or giving you, make, putting you in the hospital, but you are um, probably still going to be able to infect those around you. And the problem with transmitting the virus not only means putting vulnerable people at risk, but that the more the virus is replicated, the more likely it can turn into another variant none of the vaccines can protect us from. But Monica Gandhi, a believer in the power of masks, also believes that higher numbers of vaccinated people means that it makes sense to rethink when masks are necessary. Masks work, but they're not profoundly effective, especially on a population level. And they're important, and they're important for the individual because they can protect the individual, which is why I would protect elderly and immunocompromised inside. But they're nowhere near effective as effective as vaccinations, which right now, at least in terms of preventing severe disease, are upwards of 90% protective. If you're a fully vaccinated individual and you feel well, you taking off your mask in front of others, especially who are fully vaccinated, you are not rampantly spreading infection like we used to be concerned about prior to vaccination. Getting rid of mask mandates can also be used as an incentive to those who are hesitant to get the vaccine. You know, I am an HIV doctor at heart, and messaging and positive motivation has always been a part of our ethos. We need to use anything that we can to motivate vaccinations, including life goes back to normal, including you don't need to wear a mask. 
it's a lot to consider and can be overwhelming. If it helps, according to the CDC, if you are fully vaccinated, it still recommends that you wear a mask indoors in public if you are in an area of high transmission. DC is still considered a place of high transmission, but there are fewer hospitalizations. It's also still recommended for unvaccinated people, those with compromised immune systems or underlying medical conditions to continue to wear masks. Keep in mind that, at least in D.C., businesses are still allowed to require masks if they want to, and that local regulations will still require masks in some settings like buses, government buildings, and public schools. The rest is up to you. Thanks so much to the Washington Post video team for that piece. If you missed the top of tonight's show, stick around and we'll get you filled in on what you missed after the break. But first, if you haven't done so already, feel free to give me a shout on social media using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. Folks, puffer coats and fire feedback are gonna keep me warm this season, so don't let me down. Okay, so as always, before we wrap up the show, we wanna make sure you didn't miss anything. So we're jumping back into some of our top stories, starting with counterfeit goods and what you should look out for. Between October of 2020 and July of this year, U.S. Customs and Border Protection made over 22,000 seizures of counterfeit goods worth $2.5 billion. And they say it only gets worse during the holiday season. Half of consumers say they may have purchased a fake item while checking off their holiday shopping list. The majority of counterfeit goods in the U.S. come from China, making up over 90% of these types of shipments. Officials warn that fake goods can be dangerous to your health and safety. Items ranging from medication and personal care items to car and gun parts have been seized at ports of entry. During the pandemic, we also saw fake PPE, COVID test kits, and vaccination cards being shipped into the country. Counterfeit items also have a major impact on the economy, costing over $500 billion a year worldwide. And the lost sales of real items lead to a loss of wholesale and retail jobs as fake goods cause a shift in the normal trade channels. This year, the Chamber of Commerce and Customs and Border Protection signed a first-of-its-kind memorandum aimed at strengthening the efforts to stop the importation of fake goods. Together, the organizations plan to conduct training and outreach events to improve public awareness. People can also report counterfeits through an online reporting system. And then we highlighted Vermont's success in limiting the spread of COVID-19 and vaccinating its residents, and how it's dealing with a surprising rise in cases. Northern New England has been one of the best regions in the country at managing to keep COVID case rates and death rates low. Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire are all in the top 10 lowest overall per capita COVID case and death rates. Vermont in particular, has been a resounding success with the lowest death rate and second lowest case rate in the nation since the start of the pandemic. And its vaccine rollout has been efficient and successful with some of the highest vaccination rates in the nation. The state's public health department says 82% of Vermonters have received at least one dose of a vaccine, including already more than a third of kids ages five to 11. But there might be a bit of a downside to having such an efficient and early vaccination rollout. Case counts are now rising in Vermont faster than nearly anywhere else in the U.S. That's it for this edition of In The Loop, and we appreciate you all for watching. If you missed part of the show, all of our episodes are available on the Newsy app, and we're on the air every weeknight at 9 p.m. Eastern. But for all the latest news, you can stay right here on Newsy.